Now, along with um, the totalitarian tiptoe comes the greatest mass mind manipulation technique. This is the uh, motto of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. Ordo ab chao. Order out of chaos. Create the chaos and then offer the order out of it uh, which changes society in the way you want. This was George Bush. You're free and freedom is beautiful and you know it'll take time to restore chaos and order. Order out of chaos, but we will. He was quoting the 33rd degree motto, order out of chaos, or as I've dubbed it, problem, reaction, solution. Simple, devastating, played on us by the day. You want to change society in a way that you know if you announce it openly, you're going to get massive reaction. So you don't announce it openly, you play this scam. Stage one, you create a problem. Could be a terrorist uh, event, could be a war, it could be a run on a currency, could be a bird flu, it could be any problem that could elicit the outcome that you want. You then, through an unquestioning, pathetic mainstream media, you tell the people the version of this event that you want them to believe, i.e. Lee Harvey Oswald killed Kennedy with a gun that shot bullets that went there and then came back again. Um, I.e. a guy in a cave in Afghanistan orchestrated 9-11 and all this stuff. And if we had a media worth the name journalism, problem, reaction, solution would not be possible, it would collapse immediately. Because real journalists would investigate the official version of the problem, they'd find it was a nonsense, and they would tell the people that and they'd get a different reaction. Because they don't, because the mainstream media is just a public relations office for the official version of events, it goes through virtually undiluted. Official story, media, official story received by the people. And what they're looking for at stage two, the reaction, is outrage, fear, and words to the effect of something must be done, this can't go on, what are they going to do about it? Which allows those who've covertly created the problem, who've gleaned that public reaction, do something, they can then openly offer the solutions to the problems they have created. I've just described 9-11, by the way. I've also described the Second World War, where you had, when you do the research, a global elite that was behind uh, the Russians, and the Soviet communists as they became, who was behind the governments of Churchill and Roosevelt, one of the major, like I said earlier, Illuminati frontmen of the 20th century, who were behind the Nazis in Germany and who brought them into conflict. A major global problem. If you want to change something globally, you need to create a global problem. Conflict, Second World War. After the Second War, in just a few years, the people were mentally, emotionally, and physically exhausted. When they are doing those mind control horrors I talked about earlier, they get them, the victims exhausted mentally, physically, and emotionally because an exhausted mind becomes a much more suggestible mind. And so, how do we stop this happening again? I'll tell you. After the Second World War, an explosion of globally centralized institutions, the United Nations, the Bretton Woods Agreement, the, along came the, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and all this other stuff. And the world was transformed by the problem of the Second World War. Same with the First World War. And this was one of the most clear and obvious problem reaction solutions I've ever come across. I went on a radio station in Los Angeles days after 9-11 because they'd heard on the internet I was saying it wasn't Bin Laden, this was an inside job. This was in the first week after it. And uh, they... They said... They, they, I, I got the usual, there, there, was, there was two kind of disc jockeys doing the, doing the interview. And uh, I didn't work out which one I had the brain cell that day. It wasn't easy. And it was, oh, what, what are you on? You're mad and all that stuff. And I said to them, okay, I'll do you a deal. If this has not happened in the next month or two months, then I'll come back on your show and I'll hold my hand up and say I was wrong. All right, mate, yeah, we'll do that. Well, they never did because it happened. It was called the Patriot Act, among many other things. Because what I said was, this is going to be used to take away 
far more basic freedoms that we've taken for granted and exactly what it was used for as well as getting the war on terrorism. Henry Kissinger was supposed to have said this at a Bilderberg meeting in 1991. Whether he said it or not, it uh, sums up exactly the situation. Today, America would be outraged if UN troops entered Los Angeles to restore order. Tomorrow, they will be grateful. This is especially true if they were told that there was an outside threat from beyond, whether real or promulgated, that threatened our very existence. When presented with this scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished to the guarantee of their well-being granted to them by the world government. Problem, reaction, solution. And there is no need for prophecy about what is unfolding before our eyes today. No need for Nostradamus. In the year 2000, an organization in America uh, called the Project for the New American Century produced this document, Rebuilding America's Defenses, Strategies, Forces and Resources for a New Century, September 2000, one year before 9-11. In this organization that produced this document were all the major players that nine months after this was produced entered the White House and the Pentagon with the Bush administration. Cheney, Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, who was Deputy Defense Secretary at the time of 9-11, he's now head of the World Bank. And a stream of other people um, who have become known as neocons. Michael Ledeen in the top left-hand corner, connected into Licio Gelli and P2 and all that stuff in Italy. Uh, Richard Pearl, one of the great architects of the invasion of Iraq. Uh, John Bolton, another architect of the invasion of Iraq, now United Nations uh, Ambassador for America. Um, Feith, another one. Jeb Bush, who uh, is the president's brother. And this guy, William Crystal, who's uh, a Murdoch clone in America, who's the uh, chairman, or at least was chairman, unless they've changed it since I last looked, of the project for the New American Century. These are the people behind the document I'm going to talk about. By the way, anyone remember Mr. Pastry? Is anyone old enough? You won't, will you? But when I was a kid, there was this children's entertainer in, in Britain called Mr. Pastry. He used to jump around a lot. Well, I always called John Bolton uh, Mr. Pastry. I think it's uncanny. It's spooky, isn't it? It's spooky. And I'd rather Mr. Pastry, to be honest, was America's ambassador to the UN. I think we'd be safer. Another of these neocons is Frank Carlucci. Former number two at the CIA, Defense Secretary Reagan Bush, a very, very close associate of Father George, thrown out of two African countries for plotting to kill their leaders. Yes, we must stop terrorism, Frankie. John Negroponte, another man fundamentally connected to horrific... Yes, we must stop terrorism, Frankie. John Negroponte, another man fundamentally connected to horrific American terrorism in Central America and elsewhere. Another one of these neocons that are protecting us from the terrorists. So what did this document say in September 2000? It calls for American armed forces, the, the cavalry, on the new American frontier. It says that key allies like the United Kingdom are the most effective and efficient means of exercising American global leadership. Well, there's two to bloody tick off straight away. Keep your pen handy. The United States has for decades sought to play a more permanent role in Gulf regional security, while the unresolved conflict with Iraq provides immediate justification. The need for a substantial American force presence in the Gulf transcends the issue of the regime of Saddam Hussein. Tick. It calls for a blueprint for maintaining global U.S., i.e. Illuminati, uh, preeminence and shaping the international security order in line with the, uh, America's principles and interests. This American grand strategy, it says, must be advanced as far into the future as possible and the U.S. must, quote, fight and decisively win multiple simultaneous major theatre wars as a core cure mission. And that's exactly what they're doing. We've, we've had Afghanistan, we've had Iraq, and now they're trying to uh, uh, wangle a conflict with Iran. Tick. It says that peacekeeping missions demand American political leadership rather than that of the United Nations. It highlights North Korea, Syria, Iran, and Libya as dangerous regimes and says they're 
existence justifies the creation of a worldwide command and control system, world army. Now, the axis of evil speech involved in its uh, claims of evil, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, straight off the pages of that document. It was written by a Bush speechwriter called David Frum, who is one of those neocons connected to those people that produced the document. And they say, oh, we're still trying to stop the, 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 the war with Iraq. Oh, God, please, you've been planning it for years, mate. This document spotlights China for regime change, saying it is time for the presence of American forces in Southeast Asia this could lead to American and allied power providing the spur to the process of democratization in China. They want a war with China. I've been saying it for 10 years. That guy with a patch on his chest said exactly the same. It's leading to a war with China. They want a global problem that they can finally impose their global solution. To stop this ever happening again, we need a world government with power to stop it and an army to stop it. Exactly where they're going, which is why I was able to say this. In 1998, the plan is to engineer events real and staged that will create enormous fear in the countdown to 2012. This includes a plan to start a third world war, either by stimulating the Muslim world into a holy war against the West, or by using China to cause global conflict. Maybe both. The China thing is happening. <clears throat> the same document calls for the creation of US space forces to dominate space and total control of cyberspace to prevent their enemies using the internet. What we're seeing now, even following this, are increasing attempts and changes to dictate what you can and cannot say on the internet and to hand power over the internet to the corporations that they control. Talking, uh, talks of developing biological weapons that can target, quote, specific genotypes. This may transform biological warfare from the realm of terror to a politically useful tool. These are the very same people who are saying they need to protect us from the terrorists. Now, what else did this document say? It said that this process of transformation, all this list of things it wants to happen, would be likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Those words were published in September 2000. One year to the month later, we had what Bush called at the time our Pearl Harbor catastrophic and catalyzing event. Elephant in the living room. Who's benefited from 9-11? That's the great antidote to problem, reaction, solution, that question. Who benefits? Who benefits from me believing this version of events? Well, do the Muslim world benefit? Oh, no. What about the people who died in 9-11? No. Oh, who can benefit from this? Only those that wish to use it to justify transforming society in the image they require. I go into this whole 9-11 thing in, uh, in this book, but I'm going to go through the, uh, the whole structure of it in the next uh, half an hour or so. It has justified so much. Blair said, since 9-11, the world has changed. Yes, it has. It was meant to. The movie tells us that it was 19 hijackers orchestrated by Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. The secret agenda is problem, reaction, solution. Cheney called the war on terrorism a dirty war that might not end in our lifetimes. That's the idea. You have a war with a country, you're going to at some point reach the end of it. But when you have a war on terrorism, when does it end? When do you know the war on terrorism is over? Well, the answer in this case is when you stop, you stop planting the bombs, mate. That's when it stops, but how do the people? You can sell a never-ending war to the people who are not informed. The idea, 
The idea that Georgie Boy is orchestrating this whole thing is ludicrous. He's a front man. He, I mean, I say he's a front man to articulate um, the agenda, but he doesn't even bloody do that, does he really? The people behind him, the people you never see, Cheney's much higher in the hierarchy than Bush. His father is much, much higher in the hierarchy uh, than his son. And <clears throat> that's basically summing up what the situation is. Puppet on a string. And then there's, uh, <laughs> then there's Blair boy. Tony Blair was brought in. John Smith left us at precisely the right time. How can I put it like that? And the moment this guy, <clears throat> The moment this guy became leader of the Labour Party, Rupert Murdoch, for the first time in British newspaper history, took all his newspapers away the, from the Conservatives and started supporting Blair. Well, if that's not a sign of things to come, well, what is? So Blair becomes leader, and the two sides of the Atlantic work in coordination to the goals that we're seeing now. Alice in Wonderland. Alice said, uh, nothing would be what it is because everything would be what it isn't. And contrary-wise, what it is, it wouldn't be. And what it wouldn't be, it would, you see. That's the world we live in. Home is that way. This is the movie. This is the agenda. And we're being confused all the time by smoke and mirrors and different messages to make the truth go over there and us to look over there. And we'll see that very clearly as these, uh, this uh, section of the talk unfolds. 60 years before 9-11, we had Pearl Harbor. This was a situation where, as historians and researchers have shown in very thick, detailed books, Roosevelt had at least eight different confirmations that Japan was going to attack Pearl Harbor. Indeed, the way the American administration had acted towards Japan in the months before was designed to make them do that. And um, I came across, um, I've got my glasses, I've got them here. Came across this thing, where I, this document when I was uh, researching years ago. Came out of Britain. It was called Propaganda in the Next War. And it was a document explaining how America was going to be manipulated into the next war. And it was like, next war? What bloody next war? And a guy called Nye, actually um, on Capitol Hill, held this thing up and said, what is this? But of course he was ignored. Well, let's see what it said. This is before the Second World War and before, obviously, Pearl Harbor. To persuade her, the United States, to take our part will be much more difficult so difficult as to be unlikely to succeed. It will need a definite threat to America, a threat moreover, which will have to be brought home to every citizen before the Republic again take arms in an external quarrel. The position will naturally be uh, considerably eased if Japan were involved, and this might and probably would bring America in without much further ado. At any rate, it would be a natural and obvious effect of our propagandists to achieve this, just as in the Great War they succeeded in embroiling the United States with Germany. Fortunately with America, our propaganda is on firm ground. We can be entirely sincere, as our main plank will be the old democratic one. We must clearly enunciate our belief in the democratic form of government and our firm resolve to adhere to the old goddess of democracy routine. Pearl Harbor attacked in 1941 after this guy had spent the election campaign saying, I tell you, mothers of America, your sons are not going to fight in that war in Europe. He knows they are. Pearl Harbor got America in the war and him in the clear. Problem, reaction, solution. Six years before 9-11, Oklahoma, Timothy McVeigh. Um, unless the laws of physics were suspended that morning, there's no way that rider truck fuel fertilizer device could have brought that building down in that way. Not me, this is people like Brigadier uh, 
General Ben Partin, who spent a lifetime in explosives and weapons development with the US military, who wrote to 500 people, politicians, media people, a, a, a long, long uh, list of uh, reasons why this was impossible and why the explosives had to be inside the building on some of the pillars. He was ignored. They said that um, McVeigh had uh, gone there and found out all about it and, 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 and sussed it out, as we would say. Well, why that morning did he come into a gas station in the rider truck and ask the way to the Murrah building? I mean, you know, so connecting him and the rider truck to the Murrah building when he's about to blow it up. Why that morning was the bomb squad in full um, reaction gear in the hour and a half before the bomb went off? They denied it, but they had to admit it later through the wealth of witnesses who saw him. Why did um, uh, McVeigh, when he was uh, supposed to be uh, trying to get the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, which had a, an office there because of their um, involvement in Waco two years earlier, why, when he could have parked the vehicle right next to their office, did he park it just about as far away as it was possible to do with the Mora building? Why? were all the surveillance cameras around this building confiscated by the FBI that morning, which according to tele local television stations who interviewed people said that it showed someone looking like McVeigh leave the rider truck, but there was another guy with him, this so-called John Doe II, who suddenly disappeared from the story. The <clears throat> questions and the anomalies about uh, what happened to the Murrah building are endless because it was another inside job. Um, within 24 hours, Clinton was calling for an easing of restrictions on the American military's involvement in domestic law enforcement. And all that has been um, added to uh, since 9-11. It's a process of breaking down resistance to the Orwellian state to protect us from the terrorists who are the same people who want to introduce the Orwellian state. Now, <coughs> the Murrah building questions could have been answered very easily. You get experts to go in among the rubble and they'll tell you basically where the bombs went off, what the bombs were and the whole shebang. What the government did is employ this company, Controlled Demolition Group, to go in, pull the building down before it had been analyzed by independent experts and it was taken and, and kept in a desert under armed guard by a company called Wacken Hut and Wacken Hut is absolutely, was created and has been peopled ever since by CIA, FBI type people. And the guy who runs it is a very close associate of the Bush family, indeed has funded their political campaigns. Now, what a coincidence that when the Twin Towers fell and people were saying, hey, that did not look like a controlled demolition to me, that the rubble was taken away, indeed sold on Rudolph Giuliani's say-so and others, um, without being properly analyzed. The company they employed to do that was called Controlled Demolition. And independent experts were never allowed to investigate uh, the reason that the towers came down. Why? Because it would blow blown the whole scam. This guy, Father George Bush, as presidents go, is as high up the Illuminati uh, ladder that I've come across. Nowhere near the top, but higher from a president's point of view. And uh, this whole Bush family and around him uh, is weaved a extraordinarily uh, effective web of deception. The guy um, in the middle there, in the, the chair in the corner, is Prescott Bush, uh, the father of Father George, grandfather of Boy George, and Prescott Bush was involved with the Harriman Empire, Illuminati Empire in America, and he was involved at a very, uh, well, almost controlling level of a company called the Union Banking Corporation, the UBC. And um, as has been exposed, not just by people like me, but by people like John Loftus, the um, president of the Holocaust Museum down in Florida, uh, the Nazis were funded to a large extent out of America by these very people. The Union Banking Corporation connected into the uh, banking and steel empire in Europe of a man called Fritz Tyson who was an acknowledged funder of Hitler. And the money came out of America through to Tyson and through to Hitler. That's how they turned the Weimar Republic, which was just an economic disaster zone, 
into a uh, military force that could take on Europe. And uh, he was uh, involved in a number of companies that were actually closed down under the Trading with the Enemies Act uh, during the Second World War because they were Nazi companies, Prescott Bush, Skull and Bones. Well, he spawned the two guys who went on to become President of the United States and continue with his uh, Nazi philosophy, clearly. The Carlyle Group is uh, an organization that uh, operates uh, a lot of fundamental influence on the American government currently uh, and very much involving uh, the situation around 9-11. And the Carlyle Group has a wonderful thing, a wonderful kind of uh, way of doing things. It buys up companies that are struggling who depend on government contracts for their profitability. They ain't getting government contracts, so they're bought up quite cheaply, and then, because of these guys, they start getting government contracts and become very, very wealthy and profitable organizations. So it's a nice work if you can get it. One of the major players in the Carlyle Group has been Father George Bush. Its chairman at the time of 9-11 was Frank Carlucci, the uh, neocon who has this uh, problem with leaders of African countries. And another major player in the Carlyle Group, James Baker, who was Secretary of State to Bush when he was uh, president. And they connect into all these other people that have been behind the Bush administration. Colon Powell, they call him Colon because he's full of shit apparently. Um, <laughs> Colon Powell described Carlucci as my mentor. Do you think Carlucci and the Carlyle Group might have had just a bit of influence at the State Department when Powell was head at the time of 9-11? I think they might. And of course one of the other things about the Carlyle Group is their major, major uh, game is weapons sales. Uh, when you have a war, that's real good for business. Um, best of Powell's, the Secretary of uh, Defense and Aspartame Asp man Donald Rumsfeld was a, uh, a roommate of Carlucci at Yale University, home of the Skull and Bones, and he was a classmate of Baker uh, at Yale. Again, all these people connect and behind the scenes uh, operate the same agenda. Carl Group and Father George Bush had a very famous uh, family who were uh, their clients, the Bin Laden family, you may have heard of them, um, and did a lot of business with them. Um, when uh, Boy George st started his first energy company, appropriately called Abusto Energy, because every energy company he was involved in went Abusto. It really did. Um, one of the uh, investors in Abusto Energy was a guy called Salem Bin Laden, who was the head of the Bin Laden construction empire at the time. And then he died in a plane crash in Texas, which is kind of funny. If you, if you get close to the Bush family, I wouldn't travel by air. Bush family, I wouldn't travel by air from what I've been seeing over the years. And the Carlyle Group connected into the Bin Laden family. This was a lovely one. You remember the Kobar Towers? It was uh, <clears throat> in Saudi Arabia as part of the American base and it was uh, blown up and it was blamed on Osama Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And then the Americans employed a company to rebuild it. Bin Laden construction. <laughs> it's all in the family, you see. It is. It is. It's, it's like I say, secret agenda, connection. Movie, no connection, we're actually enemies, it says here. And of course it was uh, the Americans that brought uh, about Al-Qaeda, as we'll come to. Now, one of the things that Bush kept saying was, we must get bin Laden um, after 9-11. Well, he actually did anything but. So I think we need a whiff here on many occasions through the next few minutes. Um, this is Greg Palast, very good journalist, does some stuff for Newsnight, an American. I'm not saying Newsnight is, is brilliant, but, he, but, he, but he's very good. He did an investigation into this, uh, old bin Laden, Bush connection and Al-Qaeda, and he said this in a, in a report on Newsnight, I received a phone call from a high-placed member of a U.S. intelligence agency. He tells me that while there's always been constraints on investigating Saudis, under George Bush, this is the son, it's gotten much worse. 
After the elections, the agencies were told to back off investigating the Bin Ladens and the Saudi royals, and that angered agents because they didn't want what was coming uh, to be destroyed by um, in legitimate investigations and arrests before then. On the same uh, report by uh, Greg Palace, this is Michael Springman. He was at the U.S. consulate in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, at the time of Father George Bush's presidency. And he said this on camera. In Saudi Arabia, I was repeatedly ordered by high-level State Department officials to issue visas to unqualified applicants. These were essentially people who had no ties to either the Saudi Arabia uh, country or their own country. I complained bitterly at the time there. I returned to the U.S., I complained to the State Department, to the General Accounting Office, to the Bureau of Diplomatic Security and the Inspector General's Office. I was met with silence. What I was protesting was in reality an effort to bring recruits rounded up by Osama bin Laden to the U.S. for terrorist training by the CIA. They would then be returned to Afghanistan to fight against the then Soviets. And another guy who died at a very inappropriate time in terms of getting some truth out about this, Robin Cook, former foreign secretary, he said just before he died, throughout the 80s, bin Laden was armed by the CIA and funded by the Saudis to wage jihad against the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda, literally the database, was originally the computer file of the thousands of Mujahideen who had been recruited and trained with the help of the CIA. So the, the uh, whole Al-Qaeda is an American creation, an American invention, which is then used as the villain to um, hide who is really responsible for these terrorist outrages that have led to the changes in society that we've come across. These two people were named by the Clinton State Department as funders of um, Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, both of them fundamentally connected to the Bush family. Uh, bin Mafus was a funder of Harkin Energy. He was involved in uh, Car the Carlyle Group. Harkin Energy was another Abusto company of uh, boy George Bush. And this is why, days after 9-11, when people who with brown faces, never mind what their religion is, we can't be bothered, you've got a brown face over here, were being uh, arrested and kept without charge or trial or even knowledge of their families of where they were after 9-11, um, members of the Bin Laden family, 11 members at least, were allowed to fly out of appropriately Boston Logan Airport without any problem whatsoever back to Saudi Arabia to get out of the situation they were potentially in. And that was on the say-so of the Bush administration. Negro Ponte, he's uh, the UN ambassador at the time of 9-11. He was involved in horrendous stuff. We won't go into it, we've got time, but horrendous stuff in Central America. Horrendous uh, treatment of uh, people and mass murder. And he's gone on to be head of all US operations in Iraq and now head of US intelligence. All the same people to create the right outcome. So, 9-11, problem, reaction, solution. Well, this guy summed it up straight away. Straight after 9-11, Mr. Dark Eyes said, this is a moment to seize. The kaleidoscope has been shaken. The pieces are in flux. Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder this world around us. Problem, reaction, solution. The problem. Four aircraft pretty much simultaneously hijacked over American airspace and at no point in the entire time and period it took place was any action taken that affected the outcome of the events. This is in the most protected airspace in the world, apparently. This guy, Leroy Fletcher Prouty, worked in special operations in America time of the Kennedy administration. And he was talking about assassinations when he said this, but this sums up perfectly this whole 9-11 thing as well. He said, no one has to direct an assassination. It happens. The active role is played secretly by permitting it to happen. This is the greatest single clue. Who has the power to call off or reduce the usual security precautions? 
And again and again it works. It happened with the Kennedy assassination. It happened with the assassination of Robert Kennedy. It happened with the, uh, the killing of uh, Martin Luther King. It happened with the death of Princess Diana. At the key time, the security was withdrawn. Why? Because if it hadn't been, the assassination would not have been possible. Now, the security of American airspace is the job of this organization, NORAD. And it's very clear in the regulations, you can get them on the internet. Whenever a plane is hijacked or loses contact with air traffic con control, they have to immediately tell NORAD, the uh, military air force organization, which defends the airspace of not only America but Canada, and they send up jets to see what the hell's going on, because you can't have planes flying around uh, not connected to the, uh, uh, communicating with the ground, with, um, especially in the airspace of the east of the United States. So that's what happens, and it happens like 120, 130 days a year they send jets up in these situations. They say themselves, NORAD, that they are partners in protecting our homelands, deter, detect, and defend against air and space threats to North America. Brackets except on September the 11th. I think the four jumbo jets simultaneously hijacked in American airspace might just constitute an air and space threat to North America. So, why was nothing done that changed the outcome in any way whatsoever? This is Cheyenne Mountain, 2,000 feet deep into this uh, granite mountain is the state of the state of the state of the art of um, communications technology. These are the people in uh, NORAD and their connected organizations that work on the space shuttle. They tell uh, foreign troops uh, on the other side of the world, or American troops in foreign countries on the other side of the world, where to move and where the enemy is and all that stuff. They're following uh, something like 8,000 bits of debris going around uh, the Earth out in space. All the satellite system locks into uh, Cheyenne Mountain and NORAD. They've got um, nuclear uh, uh, safe technologies that go through to the Pentagon, which even nuclear weapons would not uh, destroy. And these are the people when uh, they were asked why they didn't react to these hijackings, said basically, no one told us. No one told us. This is the inside of Cheyenne Mountain, state of the state of the state of the art. They even say on their own website that if a missile is launched anywhere in the world, they know about it. This is the kind of technology they've got. This is from Airman magazine, uh, talking about an unmanned uh, aircraft, surveillance aircraft called the Global Hawk. On an early test, for example, Global Hawk flew at 56,000 feet over the Naval Weapons Center at Channel Lake, uh, California. The images it gathered were so clear that an electro-optical image stands out next to an FA-18 fighter. An infrared image showed where concrete had cooled down from the shadow of a C-130 that had recently taken where concrete had cooled down from the shadow of a C-130 that had recently taken off. That from 56,000 feet. And they can't find Bin Laden. And they didn't know what was happening on 9-11 because somebody never told them. What actually happened will become clear. So we have these four aircraft. They are hijacked. What should have happened, and like I say, what happens every other time is NORAD send jets up and they find out what's going on and they have this plane movement sign system that tells the pilot to follow them uh, and land where they show them. Um, when uh, this guy, Payne Stewart, a golfer, he took off, I think it was from Florida, he was in a small plane, uh, one of these Learjet things or something, and it took off and they had a, a, a compression problem and they all kind of everyone in the plane, including the pilot, went unconscious. Um, the air traffic control people involved told NORAD, NORAD scrambled jets, and the jets, jets taking over from other jets as it passed across America, um, escorted the plane across America uh, until it ran out of fuel to make sure it was going to crash in a place where there was no population. 
It said in all the news coverage at the time that the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon, in their command center, were uh, watching this happen. That's what they did for a Cessna with a handful of people in it. What did they do for a 767-757? Nothing that made any difference to the outcome. Why? Because they weren't meant to. The Federal Aviation Author Administration, they uh, call it, we call it the authority in this country, um, they um, have told me that it was there, and NORAD have told me that it was their responsibility to tell NORAD what was going on. Um, and if what NORAD say happened is true, then this organization has a hell of a lot of questions to answer about its lack of reaction. But there were many other reasons why this uh, uh, reaction didn't happen, as we'll come to. One of the interesting things about the Federal Aviation Administration is that in the year of 9-11, its head of security became Michael Canavan, who left immediately after 9-11, and his former job was um, head of psychological warfare and special operations in the American military. Bit of a career move, I feel, and an appropriate man to have on 9-11. So if we take the Flight 77 as just an example of the chaos and lack of reaction, it kind of tells the story of the other ones too. First of all, according to Robert Mueller, the head of the FBI, this terrorist operation must have been in the planning for months and years. Well, you've only got to go on the internet to find out what NORAD does when it is told a plane has been hijacked or lost communication with the ground. So you are these highly trained terrorists and your intention is to hit the Pentagon. Your plane is taking off from Washington. The Pentagon is in Washington. So what you do, even though n knowing what NORAD's reaction uh, system is, you fly the bloody plane, or allow it to be flown, right out into the Midwest, like 40 minutes an hour out, then you hijack it, and you fly the soddy thing all the way back. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And even then, even when you've hijacked it that far out and come in, there is no reaction from the military that makes any difference to the outcome at all. Some say a plane didn't hit. I'll come to that in a second, but something bloody went off there. And certainly this Flight 77 went bloody missing. Now, the story became that what happened was that when the planes were heading for the Twin Towers, they scrambled jets from Cape Cod up on the uh, East Coast, not that far from Boston, that kind of area. And by the time they got to the Twin Towers, oh, they just missed. And then, when this plane's coming all the way back from the Midwest, Flight 77, they scramble jets from 130 miles away, the Langley Air Force Base, and they almost got there, but oh, just missed. <laughs> I've got a question. Ten miles from the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., is the Andrews Air Force Base. They have no fly zones over Washington. And I rang uh, NORAD and I said, how do, you, um, how do you police the no fly zones over Washington? And they said, we leave it to the uh, Federal uh, Civilian Administration, the Federal Aviation Administration. So I'll get on to them. How do you police the no fly zone over Washington? Because you know, the way I look at it, a plane can be in there pretty damn quickly, you know, if you don't watch them. Oh, we, we react as appropriate. We react as appropriate. So, you're telling me that the no-fly zone over Washington, which you can enter in kind of seconds in a plane, is policed from 130 miles away at Langley Air Force Base? It's policed from here. The Andrews Air Force Base, 10 miles down the road from the Pentagon. By the time they're off the runway, they're looking at the bloody place. No reaction from the Andrews Air Force Base to a plane coming in to hit the Pentagon. And even as the mainstream newspapers reported, immediately after the Pentagon was hit, planes, they said, were scrambled from the Andrews Air Force Base to protect the airspace over Washington. 
Well, what were they doing before? You know, was it, a, you know, lunch go on a bit or what? Ridiculous. They were not scrambled because they weren't meant to. DC Air National Guard, the uh, Capitol's Guardians, own website. They say here, the DC Air National Guard talks about all the planes it has, stands ready to respond to the needs of the District of Columbia and the nation should the needs arise, except on September the 11th. Not one plane took off until the Pentagon was hit and it was all over. This is, what, uh, this is from a, a, a news report about the system. It happens all the time. Uh, when a small plane recently entered the 23-mile restricted ring around the U.S. Capitol, two F-16 interceptors were immediately launched from Andrews Air Force Base, just 10 miles away. In a similar episode, a pair of F-16 Fighting Falcons on a 15-minute strip alert were airborne from, uh, from Andrews just 11 minutes after being notified by NORAD that a Cessna was straying towards the White House. Jumbo jet? Nah. Won't bother, mate. Another cup of tea. Now, the 9-11 Commission, which the Bush administration fought so hard to stop, but eventually they couldn't, uh, so they put a, a guy in who's going to come up with the right stuff, they said that NORAD mistakenly sent jets assigned to guard the nation's capital to positions over the Atlantic Ocean. Ooh, what are they doing? Uh, I, thought you, I, I thought Washington was the capital of Bermuda, mate. That's why I sent them there. It's all bollocks. An order by Dick Cheney to shoot down hijacked planes did not reach pilots until 30 minutes after Flight 93 crashed. What did they send? Carry a pigeon? <laughs> it's a nonsense because it's hiding the truth of what happened. It's why they lie to us. People say, why do, why do, why do Bush and Blair lie so much? I said, they don't lie so much. They lie all the time. They have to because they are constructing the movie version of events to hide what's really happening, therefore they have to lie all the time. The 9-11 Commission said that FAA controllers lost track of Flight 77 for 36 minutes because of a glitch in the radar system. It was all going wrong that day, wasn't it? <laughs> they were slow to react and there was confusion about what they do. Well, not on any other day. This is what the uh, hijack regulations say, you get them off the internet. Um, the NORAD escort service will be requested by the FAA hijack coordinator by direct contact with the Pentagon Command Center. If you are in doubt that a situation constitutes an emergency or potential emergency, handle it as though it was an emergency. No, there's no confusion there. That's what it says. That's not what they did. Now, this whole story about launching jets, that wasn't even said at the time. Um, on the day, or a few days after 9-11, a guy called General Richard Myers, who was the acting uh, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the top uniformed soldier in American, uh, the American military, was asked if planes were launched before the Pentagon was hit. And he said, to the best of my knowledge, to the best of your knowledge, days later, if you're not asked, to the best of my knowledge, the, no planes were scrambled until after the Pentagon was hit. Now, that's immediately sounded so stupid uh, that they wouldn't react in any way. But by uh, um, September, now that's immediately sounded so stupid uh, that they wouldn't react in any way. But by uh, um, September the 15th, they were still saying publicly that no planes were scrambled until the Pentagon was hit. It was only on September the 19th, eight days after 9-11, that they issued a press release from NORAD saying, actually, we did launch jets from Cape Cod and Langley Air Force Base, confirming a CBS Dan Rather report of many days earlier. So it was, yes, we did, and no, we didn't. That's what he said. Got me things in out of order here. That's what he said, um, Myers. He then said a few days later, we've learned that they did scramble jets, and then they said they didn't, and then they said they did eight days later. So the official story was not constructed until eight days after the uh, event. Now these three guys are the three top people in the American military. 
Commander-in-Chief Bush, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, and General Myers. It's very interesting um, about their stories of what happened that day. First of all, where was Bush? He was down at a school in Florida. And I was in a bar um, in Bermuda after I'd spoken there, just after 9-11. I was watching CNN live. And I saw Bush stand up and say, uh, at a, a town meeting, as they call it, a public meeting with obviously selected guests, as usual. And he was asked by a little boy called Jordan what he was doing on that 9-11 day. And he said, well, Jordan, he said, I was at a school. He said, and I was, just before I went to the classroom, he said, I was looking at the television, he said, and I saw this plane hit the World Trade Center. And he said, this is word for word, he said, and I thought, what a terrible pilot. That's what he said. <laughs> now, the first plane was not shown on live television, only the second one. And by the time the second one hit, he is in the classroom talking to the children. No way in the world is it possible for him to have seen the first plane hit. Next day, I'm looking through the press waiting for, my God, what's the president said? Not a sod in word. So he goes into the classroom. I mean, He's just been told, by whatever means, that a plane has hit the World Trade Center. He's the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief. What does he do? He goes into a classroom and reads a story about a pet goat. Interesting <laughs> use of goat. Andrew Card. His chief of staff then comes in, and according to him at the town meeting, Bush, he said, Andy Card came in and he said to me, Mr. President, America's under attack. Now the planes hit the World Trade Center. Well, when you see the, the footage of Card going up to him and coming out, there's no way he said anything like that many words. But anyway, he's now told the president that a second plane is at the World Trade Center. What does the president do? He continues to read a story about a pet goat. And um, now we know what was really said here. He came in and said, Mr. President, America's under attack. Not playing at the World Trade Center. Okay, Andy. As soon as I know what's happened to this goat, I'll be right out. <laughs> there you go. On he goes. And the 9-11 Commission said response to the hijackings was slowed by difficulty getting secure communications among the president in Florida and officials in Washington. Nonsense! They have perfect communications all the time. Cover story. Bullshit. And then he goes off to his plane, which they said was supposed to be the next target, according to a phone call they later said was not true. And he rings to see how the sport's getting on, and away we go. Then we come to Rumsfeld. I've got this on tape at home. Um, he went on Larry King Live and he was asked just after 9-11 what he was doing on that morning. And he says that he was in his office at 8 o'clock at the Pentagon, just down the corridor from the command center that reacts to hijacks. And the plane was just taking off the first one, uh, Flight 11 from Boston. And he said he was hosting a uh, group of uh, politicians to talk about terrorism. Whoa, synchronicity day that was. He said that after a while someone walked in, it's all on tape, and gave him a note and he read it and it said that the, a plane had hit the World Trade Center. He said he walked out to get a, presidential, to a CIA briefing. He said, and within 15 minutes, he said, of leaving the room, getting the note, he felt a jarring thing which was the Pentagon being hit on the far, far side of the building. So he's given us a timeline here. Pentagon hit 20 to 10. Go back 15 minutes with 25 past 9. He's saying that the head of the military, the defense secretary, the Pentagon, 
was handed a note at 25 past nine to tell him that the World Trade Center had been hit by the first plane at quarter to nine, and they never mentioned the little, little detail that another bugger had hit at three minutes past nine. And no one had told him that another plane was heading towards the sod in Pentagon. Nonsense. This is the regulations that they have to follow. The command center will, with the exception of immediate responses, forward requests for Department of Defense assistance to the Secretary of State of Defense for approval. It goes on to say the Secretary of Defense has to be told immediately there's a problem. 25 past 9. Well, soon enough. Nonsense. This guy, um, Richard Myers, he said on uh, American military radio and television that he was um, on Capitol Hill about to go into a meeting with a politician called Max Cleland when he saw on the television that the, the uh, World Trade Center had been hit. He's the uniform head of the U.S. military, just down the road in the Pentagon. What does he do? Does he get on the phone? Does he say, what's going on? No. He said he went into the meeting with Max Cleland. He said he came out, no one told him about the second plane. He came out, he said, and, and, and immediately he came out of the meeting. Someone said, another plane's at the World Trade Center. And he said, just after that, someone said, the Pentagon's been hit. Timeline. He went into the meeting. He claims, um, before uh, three minutes past nine, because he didn't know about the second plane, comes out around 20 to 10 when the Pentagon was hit. And he is saying that no one told him the second plane had hit, that another plane was heading towards the Pentagon in all that bloody time. Nonsense. That guy was somewhere else that we'll come to in a second. It's all a frickin' lie, the whole bloody thing. Um, Richard Clark, who was the White House terrorism advisor, has said in a book that he was um, um, part of a teleconference during the 9-11 attacks, and he, um, one of the people involved in the teleconference, was General Richard Myers, who was not with a meeting with Max Bloody Cleland at all, just as uh, uh, Rumsfeld was telling a pack of lies about what happened to him. What was actually going on, has become clear since, is that there were a series of Air Force military exercises in the airspace involving the 9-11 planes uh, that were uh, sim symbolizing attacks on America. On that morning of all mornings, this was going on under various names. Um, one of them, uh, or a number of them, involved hijacked planes, but one of them involved a plane hitting a building. What a coincidence. Stands back in amazement. And who was it that was in charge of this whole shebang that morning? Dick Cheney, vice president. And what's becoming clear is this. NORAD and the FAA and all these other people were, had elements involved in all these exercises. And so when it started uh, hearing things about hijacked plane uh, heading for this, hijacked plane heading for there, people were actually saying, is this real or is this, is this the exercise? Complete bloody confusion, which is exactly what those exercises were set up to do on that day, and they had the desired effect. And amid that uh, uh, confusion, nothing was done. Uh, this is what uh, another thing that happened. Six air traffic controllers who dealt with two of the hijacked airliners on that day uh, made a tape of their experiences and what happened and, 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 their, and, and what they were dealing with. And um, the tape was destroyed by a supervisor without anyone making a transcript or even listening to it, the Department of Transport said today. It was destroyed by FAA quality assurance manager who crushed the cassette in his hand FAA quality assurance manager who crushed the cassette in his hand, cut the tape into little pieces, and then dropped them into different trash cans around the building. Do you reckon he didn't want us to hear it, or what? <laughs> and all around the 9-11, you find stuff that was uh, relevant being destroyed. Evidence. Elephant in the living room. My God. Inside job from start to finish. Total freaking lies. I was... Um, uh, in Australia and this guy who is involved in the computer system that defends Australian airspace from air, air attacks um, was, was with me for a, a day and he told me that the airspace over the Canberra Parliament building involves a system 
that if a pilot enters that uh, airspace, he is invited not by a human being but by a computer to punch in a four-digit code that gives him uh, permission to fly through that airspace. If it's not punched in, in a very short time, then the plane is taken out by ground-to-air missiles. That's what happens in Australia. What happened when Flight 11 came in, or Flight 77 rather, came in to the Pentagon? Nothing. I mean, there's no air defense to the Pentagon. They've admitted they've got ground-to-air defense for the White House. I mean, couldn't they just point them a little bit in the other direction? I mean, the Pentagon's not far. Nothing. Because it was being allowed to happen. No one has to direct an assassination. It happens. The active role is played by secretly permitting it to happen. This is the greatest single clue. Who has the power to call off the usual um, security precautions? Who had that power? The very people who've used 9-11 to take away basic freedoms and launch a war on terrorism. In other words, a war of slaughter. Then we've got this thing. I don't understand this. I think it's really strange. You know where the, where the, um, the classic shot of the Pentagon is the big wall had fallen? Well, that happened about 20 minutes to half an hour after impact. Before that, that's basically the area of the hole. Must have been a sodding small plane, that's all I can say. Whatever it was. It's the size of a, the plane it was supposed to be, and just take into account that wall fell not on impact, but 20 minutes to half an hour afterwards. Hmm, I think there might have been a bit more wreckage about than we saw, actually, myself, if that had been the case. And there was that hole on the other side. They said the reason there, there, were, there was no wreckage is the plane disintegrated when it hit the building. Well, <laughs> well a bit of it didn't. It came out the other side inside. What was that? Oh, yeah, there was a bit of wreckage. I can see them now. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I think we got away with it. God. Now, what the plane was supposed to have done was smack uh, onto the ground just before it hit the building. They got the lawn right quick, didn't they? Alan Titchmarsh must have been flown in. <laughs> oh, and this is the other thing. Where the, when the, build, where the building fell and the plane was supposed to have hit, I mean, here's a, here's a thing. This is right on the end here. Here. Here's a book. And here's a computer. Imagine, can't you? Did you just hear something? <laughs> but yet again, uh, some people say it was, a, it was actually a, 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 a cruise missile or something akin to that. Some say it was another kind of plane. But it was very strange. But then again, as with the wreckage of the Twin Towers and the uh, Murrah building, I've been to this gas station, as they call them in America, this petrol station. It's right opposite the Pentagon, where the Pentagon was hit. And I went in there to get some petrol, not realizing it was a military, a military uh, petrol station. He said, are you in the military? I said, no, thank God, no. He said, well, you can't have petrol from here then. So anyway, the point is, though, that was years ago. The point is, this gas station has surveillance cameras pointing out over that area of the Pentagon. OK, no problem. As with McVeigh and the, and the, the whole thing in, in uh, uh, Oklahoma, OK. Do you want to see what happened? All this conspiracy theory and all that stuff? Look, okay, just sit down a minute. Let me just put the tape on. There you go, that's what happened. Those were confiscated, those tapes, on the morning of 9-11 and have never been seen since. I mean, th there's not surveillance cameras. There's surveillance cameras at the local shop. There's not surveillance cameras all the way around the Pentagon and looking in at the Pentagon. Put the tape in, darling. Let's see and we'll go away. No, we're not allowed to see. And that's one of the great red flags of this whole conspiracy stuff. When we 
When we seeing or hearing something would support the official story, we're allowed to see or hear it. When us seeing something would demolish the official story, we are not allowed to see or hear it. And that's why uh, security cameras are working when they want to catch someone, and they miraculously cease to work when um, the true story of something like this would happen. How did they do it? Well, uh, I'll tell you how they didn't do it. People who couldn't fly Cessnas did not fly those planes into buildings um, with such perfection. Um, this is one uh, flight instructor, about two of them. It was dumb and dumber. I mean, they were clueless. It was clear to me they weren't going to make it as pilots. One of them was described as, um, one of them said, um, I, I was surprised he could even drive a car. And there we go. They flew these pilots. Uh, these two guys were supposed to be involved. Um, they failed to keep up their flight training, and one of them left for the Yemen for a year. Maybe you learn to fly there, who knows. Uh, Mazawi, this guy, this guy who's kind of obviously uh, mentally imbalanced, who they've uh, used to uh, highlight the whole thing again in this uh, court case, he was described as a poor pilot who fa failed to obtain a license despite hours of training. So what did they do, this, this Al-Qaeda network? They found anyone who wasn't, had any ability to fly a plane and said, get them, we'll have them. I mean, it's a joke. Arab terrorists were not flying the bloody planes, please. Yes, they were. So, what was going on? Well, first of all, we've got to understand the technology that's available. This is a thing called the Global Hawk. They fly this all over the world without a pilot. Um, they, it's a surveillance plane. They've flown it from America to Australia, America to Europe. It's flying over Afghanistan and these places now. No pilot. It's controlled from the ground. And I was, um, I was, when I was researching um, uh, Alice in Wonderland, um, I was watching um, a program in a series. Um, who's that guy who uh, fronts uh, the, the car programs? That's him, Jeremy Clarkson. Yeah, him. Yeah, I like him. He's a, he's a, bit, of a bit of a character. I like, I like him. Anyway, um, he, um, he was started off this uh, explanation of uh, the technology of, of modern aircraft. And the plane took off at the start of the show, and he's in the cockpit of this jumbo jet, and it's leaving, uh, I think it was Kennedy Airport. And he was showing what actually flies the plane. And the pilot took the plane off the runway, and then he, he, he pointed it at the first, I think they call them way stations or something like that, in the sky. There are points in the sky which the computer picks out, and it goes to that one. When it gets there, the computer readjusts and takes it to the next one, flies it over the Atlantic. Once the guy's thing's off the ground, the computer's flying the plane. Um, it comes into Heathrow, and um, the plane landed, the front wheel was on the bloody white line in the middle, and it applied the brakes, all done by computer. The next thing the pilot did was turn it and taxi it to the bloody gate. It's quite simply, if you can get control of the flight management computer system from the ground, you control the bloody plane. Simple as that. And that's what they do with this. And that's what they did, I would suggest, on 9-11. Uh, it, this uh, Global Hawk, big thing, it's got the, uh, the wingspan of a 737. And in the summer of 2001, a book came out by a, a former um, investigative producer of ABC, a guy called Bamford. And he was investigating the National Security Agency in America, which is much, much bigger than the CIA, more important. But what he did in his research, he came over, over this thing called Operation Northwoods, um, which was 40 years ago um, and run by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in other words, the Pentagon. And this is what he found, um, and run by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in other words, the Pentagon. And this is what he found. This was in official documents he came across. They obviously thought were, were destroyed. Operation Northwoods, the plan called for innocent people to be shot on American streets. This is the Pentagon for boats carrying refugees fleeing Cuba to be sunk on the high seas, for a wave of violent terrorism to be launched in Washington, D.C., Miami, and elsewhere. People would be framed for bombings they did not commit. Planes would be hijacked using phony evidence, all of which would be blamed on Castro to justify an invasion of Cuba 40 years ago. And 
This is another thing that was in this document. They were going to do this 40 years ago. An aircraft at Elgin um, Air Force Base would be painted and numbered as an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft belonging to a CIA propriety organization in the Miami area. At a designate time, the duplicate would be substituted for the actual civil aircraft and would be loaded with selected passengers all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. The actual registered aircraft would be converted into a drone remote controlled plane, their word for it, takeoff times of the drone aircraft and the actual aircraft would be scheduled to allow a rendezvous south of Florida. What it was uh, going on to say was that when the drone aircraft replaced the real aircraft, um, it would be flown um, according to its flight plan, that's why they chose that particular route, um, over um, Cuba and it would be destroyed by radio controlled explosion and it would be blamed on a ground-to-air missile from Cuba, therefore justifying the invasion of Cuba. They had the capability of doing that with a remotely controlled aircraft 40 years before 9-11. Imagine the technology they have now. That's what happened. And this NORAD is one of the major organizations that's been involved in the development of um, remotely controlled aircraft. The black boxes. If us seeing or hearing something would destroy the official story, we don't see or hear it. Where's the black boxes? Oh, they're destroyed, mate. Well, that's funny. It doesn't happen in other cases. The hijackers. 19 hijackers. We don't know who they are. Suddenly, here's the list. Size of shoes. Everything. And you know what they've said? They've just come out and said this. The reason they knew this is because it was all in Mohammed Attar's bag that didn't make it onto Flight 11. The coincidences, that's just amazing. Synchronicity, it must be true. These people, seven of these people at least, have been tracked down by the mainstream press. They're still alive. <laughs> what do they do, parachute? I mean, well, what's going on? <laughs> and then, and then, and then you've, got, you've, got these, you've got these Korans everywhere. They left them in bars, in bloody hotel rooms, and bloody cars. I mean, what were they? The Islamic equivalent of the Gideons? Who were these people? <laughs> and, then I, and then I sat in my front room, and, and I watched a newsreader tell me on the BBC, without laughing, just a few days after 9-11, that they found a passport from one of the hijackers. I mean, was it singed? I mean, what were you? I'm not a physics major, but paper passport, I think there's, I think there's questions to ask here. And I, I, I rang the New York police in, a year later uh, 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 when I was doing the Alice in Wonderland book, and oh, no, we can't talk about that, there's an ongoing investigation, oh, God. And then there was an ITV television documentary a year after 9-11, and they asked the same question, and the FBI said, the hijacker's passport is a rumor that might be true. <laughs> this is a year after they called a press conference to announce it. Why? Because we go back to connecting the dots. They know that vast majority of people do not connect the dots. They don't remember what they were told on this day as opposed to what they were told on this day and this day. And therefore, what they wanted in that period was emphasize, program, yes, it was them Islams, yeah. So we found a passport, proof. Oh, we found a, we found a Korans in this, everywhere. Oh, it was them Islams. And then, once the programming is done, they can just walk away, because they know most people won't say, well, hold on a minute. But some people do, and increasing numbers of people do. And uh, th that's how the, the dots get connected. Now, this is, a, this is, this is a, a, extraordinary. This is the official FBI timeline of Mohammed Attar. They said that him and this guy, Abdulaziz Alamori, who turned out not to be, um, actually, instead of being in Boston when they were going to hijack Flight 11 in the morning of, 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 of September the 11th, they drove down to Portland, Maine the night before. I mean, you know, was it a better hotel? I mean, what's going on? So, and he said that they left their hotel on the morning of September the 11th at 5.33 to catch a plane at 6 o'clock, which is the only one that would have got them onto Flight 11. 
Did the alarm not go off? Did they oversleep? I mean, what are we talking about here? See them dashing around the hotel. Oh, I'm all get up. See the time. Knickers, pants everywhere. Oh. Uh, then they're supposed to arrive um, to catch a plane at six o'clock. Um, and, and it was all these great hijackers. And one of the things that um, people say is, oh, no, no, I saw Atari get on the plane. Uh, they, they've, got, they've got this uh, surveillance camera. No. Of all the airports in all the world, at this time when there's cameras everywhere, the one international airport with no surveillance cameras in its departure lounge is Boston Logan Airport. There are no pictures of him getting on the plane. This is Portland, Maine, where this comes from. And in the middle, you've got 5.45, 15 minutes to uh, departure, which gives it kind of a reasonable thing, yes, 15 minutes. But actually down here, it's 5.53, in fact, 5.54, six, six minutes to departure, and th which, would, which would ask the question, why did they leave it so sodding late? Well, maybe it wasn't too important for them to get on it, because maybe they didn't know they were going to hijack something. Um, and I, I, I called the people at... Um, uh, head of security at Portland, Maine, and I said, why does, that, does it have two timelines, and why does it have one right in the middle of the shot where you at least want numbers if you were trying to identify someone? I don't know, she said. I, um, I said. I said, do you think you could ask? Do you think you could look at the tape and call me back? She says, oh no, the FBI took that tape away on the morning of 9-11 and we've not seen it again. Of course, that was put in because in the newspapers, that's what the framing was, uh, and, and, and uh, it hid the fact that as one person said, they were so late they were spitting bullets or spitting blood or something. There is no evidence this guy got on the plane. No evidence whatsoever, ever, including the fact that none of them were on the, uh, the list of passengers. This is Abdulaziz Alamori, who's supposed to have been but wasn't the night before 9-11. He looks like he's going to kill himself the next day, doesn't he? Yeah, but that's not Alamori. That's Alamori. This is a Saudi airline pilot who was sitting in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and heard on the news that he just hijacked a bloody plane in America. <laughs> he went into the American consulate there and said, I think there might be a, a mistake. I think there might be. But they've never changed the names. They said that this guy, Rotvi, uh, uh, Lotvi Racy, uh, uh, was, uh, had helped them to, to, to learn how to fly the planes, not very well. They said that he was an Islamic extremist. They put him in Belmarsh prison. They tried to uh, take him to America. And they said he was an Islamic extremist when he's married to a French, white, Roman Catholic. Yeah, it all fits. It's all rubbish. It's all rubbish. And the people here, rubbish, rubbish, um, uh, what uh, most of them are claimed to have done. And that's why they're having to let them out now, slowly. These people are completely untrustworthy, wouldn't know the truth if it bit them on the arse. And, and the same with the, the Twin Towers, again, controlled um, explosion taken away by controlled demolition appropriately. When you look at the um, controlled demolition pictures, they're available everywhere, lots of programs about them. At the point where the explosives goes off, there is a, an outward puff of, of smoke as the charges go. That is exactly what you see on the Twin Towers before they started to fall. Um, in all these things, it's uh, classically what happened uh, to the Twin Towers. Controlled demolition. Look at that one in the middle on the left there. What you see on, uh, in that building is what you saw when the uh, Twin Towers started to fall. These are some buildings that fell due to structural failure. They don't go straight down on themselves. They don't turn to dust. And the, the, the speed that the towers fell was the speed of free fall without any resistance. Free fall speed. Why? Because there was nothing to resist because they were taken out by explosives. Because that was the classic mind-imposing, mind-programming vision of 9-11 that would be in the public mind to use problem, reaction, solution to justify, justify uh, the outcome. This guy, William Rodriguez, maintenance man at the World Trade Center, he was a hero after 9-11 because all the people he got out and the, the heroic things he did, pictured with George Bush, the moment he came out and said, actually, bombs were going off at the bottom of the, of, of the building before the building fell, and people with him said, yes, they were, then suddenly he becomes persona non grata. They took his job away and tried to destroy the guy. He's actually taken them to court and issued a, um, a court uh, um, uh, lawsuit against them for being involved in 9-11, people like Cheney and Bush and others.
This guy, Larry Silverstein, he bought the whole of the World Trade Center just before 9-11 and he, he, he put massively increased insurance on it, which is being paid out. And he said um, he owned this building uh, called Building 7 on the World Trade Center complex. And he said on television uh, in an interview that the authorities came to him uh, on 9-11 on and said the building is in such a bad state we, 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 we want to pull it. In other words, pull it, we want to controlled uh, demolish it. And he agreed and they said it was pulled. Here's building seven, here's all the telltale charges coming out that demolished building seven. Now there's a question here. If you've ever seen these programs where they pull buildings of that size, they don't go and put the charges in in a few hours. Sometimes it takes days to, to, to put them in the right places so it falls as it did. On 9-11, on they pulled this building in next to no time. Why? Because it was charged already. In Building 7 was a state-of-the-art command center, which had been recently built uh, at a cost of $13 million at uh, the instruction of Mayor Giuliani. And uh, a guy I had a long conversation with uh, called, uh, he's a, a German, um, former German defense minister called uh, Andreas von Bülow, and he uh, has come out publicly and said he's certain that 9-11 was orchestrated from the command center in Building 7, and the reason they pulled it was to destroy the evidence um, of what happened. Um, I think he's not far from the truth. Mayor Giuliani, buy a used car, wouldn't buy a new one, mate. I won't go into that. So the whole kind of story of 9-11 is full of holes because it's not true. And the media, despite these holes, continue to parrot the official version of everything. As a result of it, the secret agenda can impose its Orwellian state while the movie tells us it's to protect us. Sums it up, Anglo-American special relationship. Will you lie first or shall I? And so you keep the old black and white. You're either with us or you're against us. You're with us or you're for the terrorists. You ignore the fact that there was great uh, grief and uh, support from the Islamic world for what happened because this is what you're after. This is the Nazi technique. Why of course the people don't want war. Why should some poor slob on a farm want to risk his life in a war when the best he can get out of it is to come back to his farm in one piece? Naturally the common people don't want war neither in Russia nor in England, nor for that matter in Germany. That is understood. But after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for their lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger, it works the same in any country. Hermann Goering. And that's what they're doing now. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. Without, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing su can succeed. He who molds public opinion is greater than he who enacts the laws. He might have said, and he who molds public opinion can enact whatever laws he wants. Problem, reaction, solution. Control of the public mind. All propaganda, said Hitler, must be so popular and on such an intellectual level that even the most stupid of those towards whom it is directed will understand it. People can be made to uh, perceive paradise as hell and the other way round to consider the most wretched sort of life as paradise. That's the key line. All propaganda must be on such an intellectual level that even the most stupid towards whom it is directed can understand it. Bin Laden did it. It's Al-Qaeda. That's the mantra on the most basic level. Exactly. There you go, Georgie. Uh, this is uh, Blair showing the evidence that Bin Laden would, uh, was orchestrating it. This is the Americans looking at the evidence, you know. Here you go. Lies, lies, lies. I'm sorry, that's all I can say. All my other lies are classified. Um, this is the level we've got to after 9-11. They are harboring a terrorist and they need to hand him over. There's no need to discuss innocence or guilt. We know he's guilty. That's the new world order that we're coming into. Bin Laden, um, I can't go into him much because um, uh, we're 
I want to get some other things in before, before we finish this section. But he, he said in this um, so-called uh, video in which he admitted it, we did not reveal the operation to them until just before they boarded the planes. Eh? <coughs> now, come on. They're boarding. Over here, over here. Right. You know those, you know those big, big towers? Nine Eleven Commission, only two days before the attacks, they had still not agreed what targets to hit. The 9-11 date was selected three weeks before the attacks. You're having a bloody laugh. Have you ever seen this film, Wag the Dog? Wag the Dog. What they do, um, um, if you really haven't seen it, the president, uh, is, uh, a sex scandal is about to break, and there's an election coming up, so they invent a war that's not actually taking place. They get this top Hollywood uh, producer to um, produce this war footage from the front, and they choose a war with Albania, because they reckon no American's ever heard of Albania, um, and they have this war, and they get it all on the front pages, and the footage from the front is coming from a Hollywood studio, and they hide the fact that the, uh, the, the president's had this sex uh, scandal until after the election. And when you watch the movie, it's so real. Uh, this is um, how we tell if there's a terrorist at the airport now, apparently. <laughs> yeah, we've got to keep things real simple here. There you go. God, he's dangerous. But you keep... You keep focusing on what you want to focus on until he's passed his sell-by date, which is now. You talk about freedom while taking it away, and you can take 3,000 dead people in America and turn them into, well, far more than 5,000 dead civilians now in Afghanistan, and you can call it a glorious victory. That is uh, terrorism. That is fighting for freedom. That is evil. That is the will of God to bring peace to the world. Wanted for terrorism. Biggest terrorists in the world. Well, I see bigger ones behind them. <laughs> bigger terrorists than them behind them, but on the public stage, there they are. Definition of a terrorist. One who favors or uses terror-inspiring methods of governing or coercing government or community Hence, terrorism. I wonder if that definition includes 16-year-old ice cream vendors in Afghanistan having their legs blown off. I wonder if it involves uh, the slaughter of innocent kids in Afghanistan, the invasion of a country that was a, a, a Stone Age country in the middle of a famine at the time. This was before the invasion. All of that, created by the CIA, wanted by the FBI. Strange but true. Those Tora Bora uh, tunnels where he's hiding, they were built <clears throat> by Bins at Laden construction with CIA money funneled through um, ISI, the Pakistan Intelligence Agency. Um, there you go. You're the head of the snake. You're the head of the snake. You're both right. Then we had the, um, the anthrax um, outbreak, which ended immediately. It was, it was revealed that the strain was only used by the American military. Went straight off the headlines then. I saw this headline, Cheney, Cheney says anthrax packages are very worrying. I put on the bottom, well, stop sending them then, Dick. <laughs> and this is how it's done, this structure. You have um, the terrorism or the uh, people blamed for terrorism and the secret societies of the Islamic world, of which there are many, many, just like everywhere else, and you encompass them in the same pyramid in your Russian doll structure as the United States, American governments, FBI, CIA. So at this level of the pyramid, you are dictating to both apparent opposition sides within the public arena. And from this level, you orchestrate it being carried out, you orchestrate the lack of um, response and the lack of uh, the defense uh, system uh, being activated and you carry out the whole thing by pulling the strings of all elements of both sides and that's how it all works and that holding the strings is the level we never see the spider in the center of the um, the web now the solution more and more changes in society homeland security military dictatorship we're in the same in this country 
Um, support the glorious war. Help us find a terrorist. St uh, tell us about your strange uh, behavior of your neighbors. You know, tell on your friends. We want people uh, to be informers because we want to protect everyone. This is an FBI leaflet that says that people to watch for involving terrorists are defenders of the U.S. Con Constitution against the federal government and the U.N. You're a terrorist to do that now. Um, and this is what Adolf Hitler said when announcing the creation of the Gestapo. An evil exists that threatens every man, woman, and child of this great nation. We must take steps to ensure our domestic security and protect our homeland. If George Bush had said that, Tony Blair had said that, well, we wouldn't have been surprised. Straight out of the mouth of Adolf Hitler, because the same mentality is in place. And then we go back to Babylon. Uh, through uh, uh, Bush again, Father Bush uh, involved through his son. And at Saddam Hussein, he was a great friend of America. He was one of their blue-eyed boys until it became much better for the agenda for him to be used as the fall guy. And in the run-up to this uh, war, we had uh, history to look at. First of all, the 1991 war with Iraq, which they could have removed Saddam then. They chose not to on the orders of uh, Father George because his card had to be played later. And in the meantime, while they had the, the uh, no-fly zone and all that stuff through the 90s of Iraq, um, there were children being killed on a constant basis by American uh, bombing um, in Iraq in the no-fly zone. Uh, and then uh, you had the horrific, and still have the horrific results of the spent uranium in the weapons that they've used in Iraq in the first Gulf War and in the second. Horrific things happening to children being born in Iraq now because of the uh, pollution uh, of the uranium in the bombs that have uh, been bombarding that country. Then we had the uh, sanctions on Iraq in the run-up to the second uh, war, which, according to UN figures, cost fantastic numbers of lives of children. Half a million, a million uh, of, of, uh, are some of the figures that have been uh, talked about. 4,500 children under the age of five dying each month in Iraq because of the sanctions in the run-up to the war. And this was an interchange on a 60 Minutes program in America. We've heard that half a million children have died as a result of sanctions in Iraq. I mean, that's more children than died in Hiroshima. And you know, is the price worth it? Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. And when I talk about America and Britain, I'm talking about their governments being used as vehicles of this hidden force, this Illuminati, to bring about the global change I'm talking about. Not the people, there's vast numbers of people in America that don't want this. Um, and they've taken over Iraq because that was the idea. The idea they're going to come out of it is just ridiculous. They're there because they're meant to stay there. And this is the special relationship. Blair's time is coming to an end now, but same thing will continue. Uh, now, invasion checklist. Missiles, tanks, troops, planes, bombs, ships, guns are reason. Problem, reaction, solution doesn't always need a real problem. It just needs the public perception of a problem. And so uh, they invented the idea of weapons of mass destruction to sell the idea of the invasion. Now, of course, people get, you know, challenged. Oh, where are the weapons of mass destruction? But it doesn't matter because what they wanted to achieve by the lie has been achieved. They're in Iraq and they ain't coming out. Uh, again, the secret agenda in the movie telling us different things. Um, this is a, a leaked document from uh, Downing Street that shows uh, that they were certain they were going to invade Iraq long before uh, they actually did. In fact, it was years. There you go, there's the reason. Dead simple. And there he is, he's found in the plane, look, special. So yeah, it's, Iraq was involved in 9-11. Here's the uh, weapons of mass destruction evidence. Here's some more, and along we go. There's the whole dossier on the weapons of mass destruction. Not a problem. There's one of them. There's the, uh, there's the mobile weapons laboratories, look, there you go. They're very, very canny, these people. Many look like a London bus. And, of course, 
like I said right at the start, just because you have two sides that appear to be uh, against each other doesn't mean they're not controlled and manipulated by the same force. In 1983, Donald Rumsfeld was sent to Iraq to organize the shipment for Saddam, there's the meeting, of biological and chemical weapons for use against the Iranians in the Iraq-Iranian war. And these were the chemical weapons shipped through the American government from American corporations that were used to kill the Kurds. But because they keep that quiet, it means they can use the, the chemical uh, attack on the Kurds as a justification to remove Saddam. It's all smoke and mirrors. And this is um, not me um, surmising this. This came out in official documents, I think 2002. This is one, it's a report in a newspaper. Donald Rumsfeld, the US Defense Secretary and one of the most strident critics of Saddam Hussein, met the Iraqi president in 1983 to ease the way for US companies to sell biological and chemical weapons, including anthrax and bubonic plague cultures, according to newly classified US documents. And before he became Secretary of State, Donald Rumsfeld was on the board of a European engineering giant called ABB. And he was on the board when they sold nuclear technology to North Korea. And then he becomes Secretary of State and says, they're dangerous, North Korea, they've got nuclear technology. Yes, you sold it to them, you silly sod. <laughs> but it was meant to be sold to them. Problem, reaction, solution. Keep following the white rabbit, keep believing what they tell you, and war is peace and get a brain more ands. <laughs> and as a result of it, slaughter in Iraq. And it, uh, somebody told me John Wayne was dead. I don't think he's dead. I see him everywhere. I see him on Fox News. I see him on CNN. I see him uh, in the US military. He's everywhere. Go get him, John. Sitting on tanks, embedded journalists. Oh, I see him all. Yeah, go get him, John. This is the stuff they don't want us to see. The real impact of the war on terrorism by the terrorists. Every single day it's happening. Liberated, liberated, liberated. And this, uh, the, the thing that they're using also are cluster bombs. There are these people that are protecting us from the terrorist cluster bombs. A spokesman for the International Committee of the Red Cross in Iraq described the scene in Hilla as a horror Dozens of severed bodies and scattered limbs. Journalists found babies cut in half, amputated limbs, kids with faces, a web of deep cuts caused by American shell fire and cluster bombs. Robert Fisk, a journalist worth the name on The Independent, described the mortuary as a butcher's shop of chopped up corpses. This is what cluster bombs do. And this is what is being done in our name, wrongly, but in our name, in Iraq, and they want to do it in other places too. And somebody tells me that people that do this wouldn't kill 3,000 people on 9-11 to give them the justification of doing this. You know, if we think... If we, if we, if we judge what this network would do on the basis of what we would do, we lose the plot because we have empathy with people who suffer the consequences of our actions. If we did that, well, God, how would we live emotionally? To them, no problem. So they don't have this fail-safe mechanism of empathy with the consequences of your actions. And, you know, I, you know I'm sick of this. I'm sick of this bloody morality. Do you ever see this here? In America, uh, Janet Jackson, is it Justin Timberlake? Sick of this bloody morality. Do you ever see this here? In America, uh, Janet Jackson, is it Justin Timberlake? I don't know, something to do with wood anyway. He, um, <laughs> he was at the Super Bowl and just by accident, stands back in amazement, her breast came out, right? There was moral outrage in America. 
It's disgusting, Janet Jackson. Immoral. I wonder which of these pictures is more sodden immoral. One of the British soldiers uh, in a BBC documentary, we bomb them, you know, it's cool to me because I like explosions and stuff like that, but like, I don't get to see the actual explosion and that's what I want to see, but I guess when we get closer to Baghdad, we'll get to see more of that. Yeah, ooh, yes. Support our troops. No! Support people who are coming from a point of empathy. Not all of them are. Some of them may be, but misguided in the way they express it, but not all of them. And, and even the troops, this is a, uh, a, a, a surgeon in Germany talking about the incredible life-changing, life-destroying uh, things that are happening to troops that are never talked about. Our boys, like I said earlier, we will not surrender. No, we don't sod in after. We send these poor buggers to, to face it. To fight on our behalf, yeah, no problem. And Henry Kissinger, Henry Kissinger summed the whole thing up when he called the military uh, dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns to foreign policy. And that's all these, these guys are to, um, uh, to uh, these people that run the world. Couldn't care less. And then, you know, it's all the, the fake stuff goes on, like they pulled this bloody statue down. I was in America. I watched CNN hold a, hold a live picture of this statue for two hours, live, before it actually came down. And um, I love this one. It was in a place called Palestine, I think it was Palestine Square, something like that. They were, they were the people there watching it come down. I don't think too many, myself. Um, on the front of the Evening Standard, there they are again. What? Uh, where did they come from? And then what you do is, as someone pointed out, if you go through the crowd, you see the, you see the same guy over and over again. <laughs> what they've done is they've taken a shot off the telly of a few, and they've just kind of made them smaller going back. You can trust the media. They wouldn't lie to you. They'd lie to everybody. There you go. Where did it all come from? Then you've got Saddam Hussein. Um, both ITV and BBC, in the run-up to the uh, last uh, the invasion of Iraq, uh, they had facial experts look at all this footage of um, Saddam, and they found at least seven or eight different Saddams. And uh, have they got the one at the moment? I don't know. Apparently, according to newspaper reports, his wife was taken to see him, this present Saddam, and it said um, that she arrived from Syria with her official escort and then entered the prison, emerging only moments later, pink with rage and shouting, this is not my husband, but he's double. Where is my husband? Take me to my husband. <laughs> American officials rushed forward to shield Mrs. Saddam from perplexed Russian observers, trying to insist that Saddam had changed quite a lot in custody and she probably didn't recognize him. <laughs> But when you go again through the 9-11 story and old kind of Rumsfeld, no one told him the plane had hit and he, all that stuff, okay, what else will they try? I mean, crikey, nothing's crazy anymore. The picture off in Iraq, heading, handing over Babylon, I love it. We're going to hand it back to the people you have in, you're having me on, no way. And all these people like Shalabi, CIA uh, and uh, British intelligence, uh, the first uh, kind of interim leader, Alawi, MI6, CIA, all the gang are there. Eh? There. But no, he's come. He's come to protect us. There you go. War crimes uh, against humanity. That's what they're wanted for, and in the end, history repeating itself. It's just a global version. I love that one. Same shit, different asshole. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. <laughs> I know, mean, that's fantastic. Yeah, and now we're heading for the next one in the list, Iran. You see, when you follow the kind of background and you follow the project, the New American Century, you know, anyone's followed my website and stuff like that, you're sitting there, okay, 
They're now well ensconced in Iraq. Okay, it's, it, it's, it's not going well on the surface, but if you want to stay there, you don't want it to go well because then you've got no justification for staying there. So you don't want it to go too well. Um, and the next on the list, uh, Iran. And then you just wait in. Here we go. And oh, there's a problem with Iran now. Oh, here we go. And then it will be North Korea, and then they'll want China. I mean, crikey. Stop asking questions. You're either with us or against the terrorists. I promise never to question authority. You're a good citizen. Go get them, John. Isn't it funny that when you protest like these uh, people here against war, they bloody shoot at you with rubber bullets and stuff. This is a protest in Oakland. And they have now free speech zones back from where anyone's meeting, so you can't protest directly. And, you know, that previous picture is something to emphasize. There are enormous numbers of people in America who don't get a voice. Enormous numbers who would be sitting here today if this was in, an Amer in, a, in America because they can see through it. It's not the Fox News mentality of America is not the only mentality. Far from it. But again, we come back to this. Again, the lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic and or military consequences of the lie. That's why they have to suppress dissent.